Jason is also known as Swell Runner, started creating vlogging as a hobby, an outlet. He created um, or he covers everything from installs to amazing overland adventures. Apparently he was looking for a release sort of a, somewhat from his day job, looking to have fun, go out on adventures, create memories with his family and see amazing places. Jason, welcome to Snail Shop Talk. How are you doing today? I am great. How are you guys? How's everybody else? How are you? Doing good. Doing good over here. How's uh, how's your life been over there? Where are well? Where are you right now? I know you travel around a bunch. Uh, so I'm at I'm at home just outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, up in the mountains, a uh, little ski town called Park City. Okay. And uh, so I, I've not really been traveling much lately. Um, I'm just at home. Got it. Got it. That's very nice. I know um, you were bouncing back and forth from Florida while you were living there for a while. Are you uh, permanently out of Florida now? Yeah, yeah. We we moved full time out to Utah back in August of 2018. Okay. Um, traveled back to Florida a lot, you know, because that's where our primary business is. Um, yes. But yeah, we're we're still we're we're out in we're out in Utah full time. Excellent. Okay. Good to know. Um, there's man. Utah is. Like, I think it's the new hub of the new, like, trail exploration area. You know, everybody enjoying things out in that area. What, uh, how do you feel about that? Um, so Utah is known as being sort of like this, this wonderful outdoor Mecca. And I, and I would mm -hmm. say that generally it is. The interesting part about where we live, it's gorgeous, but there's a very small window of time that you can actually okay. explore. <laughs> Got it's it. covered in snow and the trails are closed like six months out of the year at least maybe right. even six, eight months out of the year it's it's crazy okay yeah that makes uh that's understandable we um i just went up into the hills out here in california i'm outside of sacramento area and um i was able to go quite a ways up into some of the trails but once you get farther up it's still covered in snow out here so makes sense <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful area. That's one of the things that we've grappled with. Mm -hmm. it's, there's just a very small window of time that we can actually, you know, explore the outdoors up where we're at. Now, you can go south to, to Moab or, you know, southern Utah and, and several places in what they call the West Desert. Uh, and there's, there's a much larger window of opportunity to be able to enjoy those areas. But I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have any issue with the desert. Desert's fun. But I'm like, I'm kind of a forest guy. I really like being okay. in the forest. Yeah, yeah. And the forests around here are kind of, you can't, can't get to them except for, like I said, that small window of time. Sure. Definitely. How's, um, how's the uh, COVID um, things affecting you guys out there? Um, you know, just in that state mainly. You know, the state of Utah has been, has been okay. Interestingly enough, I mean, I, you, I watched the numbers and it's hard to know what, like, what the numbers actually are right because there's a lot of discrepancies in terms of reporting but just from a statistical perspective and the publicly available information the state mm -hmm. of utah has not fared i mean it's fared very well there's there's not been a whole lot of, of spread there's not been um, very many cases certainly nothing like uh, what you see in, in hot spots in, around the country like new york for instance right um new york's been hit very very hard um generally like our whole way of life was was really mostly shut down the first two weeks in april First three weeks in April, week three, week four, people started kind of feeling a little more comfortable about going out. We had mm -hmm. stay, stay. Uh, I don't remember what stay the actual. Yes, yeah, so some stay, stay at home directives. You know, stay safer at home kind of directives. Um, you know, and, and a lot of businesses were closed down. Um, but but really, this week, beginning May fourth, um, yesterday, uh, everything's been not opened up, but but we've kind of gone into that first phase, if you know what I mean. Um, you're seeing a lot of more people out there. A lot of businesses are open. Restaurants, I think, can open to 25% capacity. Um, they're doing this sort of phased reopening, and, and you're seeing a lot of things kind of loosen up. So, so that feels good for sure. Yeah, definitely. We're still in shelter-in-place ordinances out here in California. Um, I know. But, but what's are... interesting is that a lot of the like um, forestries are opening up and telling um, people that they can go out and go in an adventure. Um, so. Right. Yeah, it's I that's I felt that me going um, you know, over landing or off-roading with some of my friends was still keeping it, you know, a good safe distance apart from each other, you know, being in our own rigs. 
Yeah, you know, all of the local counties and sort of state park, local county and state parks, BLM land never closed. Uh, the official language on the Bureau of Land Management BLM website was, mm -hmm. you know, public lands are available for use, practice social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, you know, so that, so that was that was never really off limits. Um, but uh, your county and state parks were um, they yeah. were they were off limits to anybody outside of whatever county you lived in. Um, but but uh, I guess two weeks ago, everything opened up in terms of, uh, you know, your county and state parks in the state of Utah. And I don't know that everything, but for the most part, anyway, a uh, buddy of mine last week were able to go out and, and uh, it was mostly BLM land anyway. But but we, we practiced social distancing while we were out, which is really not hard to do when you're camping. Um, no. and, uh, but it was, it was really refreshing to go out for a couple of nights there. Yes. I, I fully understand that after being stuck in the house and, you know, just working in my shop and being able to go out into the mountains and adventure yeah. was, was a blessing. Definitely. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's jump back many, many years. I, uh, read somewhere, um, I found some information about you saying that you've uh, been camping, um, all, mainly all your life, uh, you know, was that something that your parents instilled in you? Is that something that, um, you know, wh were you a Boy Scout? How did you, how did you start camping? I'd be curious to know where you read that because I haven't been camping all my life. Um, oh, really? That's not that's not the story I've, I've been telling. So, interestingly enough, the story the story goes: I grew up um, wanting to go camping and like mm -hmm. wanting to do some of these outdoor things. I, I wanted to be in the Boy Scouts, and okay. um, <laughs> my. So my dad grew up on a farm. My mom grew out and grew up in a in a poor house, rural Illinois country, you know. And and I think I think you know they, they worked really hard to um, you know earn a living and and do as well as they could for themselves. So you know we mm -hmm. grew up. I, I was comfortable, you know. We never had uh, I didn't have anything fancy, you know. But but we always we always had food and and you know they bought me a car when I was sixteen. It was a real cheap old car, but you know I mean we had all these normal comforts, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, and I just I just you know, I've talked to my dad about it. You know, he would tell me, no, you don't, this is, this is his, my, my, uh, this is my, my dad impression. Mm -hmm. No, you don't, you don't want to sleep outside. That's uncomfortable. You know, no, <laughs> you don't want to do this. You know, that's, yeah. I mean, it was just, he didn't want, he didn't want to do any of that stuff. And so okay. I didn't get to do any of that stuff. Um, you know, really my first time ever camping, I was in college. And uh, I was on a, uh, I studied underwater crimes investigation. I was on a dive trip that was, uh, it was a college trip. And we were, we were going someplace in Florida, diving, doing part of our studies. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the deal was we had to camp outside. So I had to get some gear and, nice. and just a tent, you know, slept on the ground, super uncomfortable. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I had kids that were in Cub Scouts and wanted to go camping and so started figuring out gear and stuff and whatever and uh and and so you know and we we weren't camping much we didn't do a whole lot you know but we did some um you know and then and then back in in 2015 i was um i was looking around for just my next vehicle and i didn't want to get another car i wanted to get a, a toyota firstly because the car i was coming out of was super unreliable and i was tired of the problems Okay. And I knew Toyota was going to the opposite end of the spectrum there and, and that I wouldn't have any reliability issues. Right. And I wanted right. to get a truck because I never had a truck and I wanted to have four wheel drive because I never had four wheel drive. That sounded fun. And uh, actually, if you go back and watch the very first video uh, that I ever made, um, I kind of talk about, you know, this this whole idea of overlanding and how it was like it just kind of like magically fit this concept and idea of, of what I thought I wanted to kind of get into and do. And and um, and it really has been kind of a dream come true from like the perspective of me just liking to like liking to tinker with things and mess around with things and mess with gear and play with cameras and, and and mess with video and have a creative outlet and then you know like to you know get off grid and kind of have some time to myself and not really to myself but just like be away from work and have these little micro trips you know it just it's been a really really comprehensive solution for my mental well-being <laughs> yeah oh uh, yeah you know, a little so. bit i mean there's, you know, I think there's something to be said about getting outdoors and going to explore and going new places. And, you know, that you have the um, dendrites inside of your brain that are, um, are, are these sensors that will like really start to, you know, make endorphins move and, um, you know, and just make things happier when you start to experience new things and go out and explore and have fun. 
you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, camping and, um, and exploring and overlanding and all that kind of goes hand in hand with all of that. I, I understand that completely. Um, no. So let, let's take a small step backwards. And uh, what was this unreliable car? Or what was one of your first cars that you ever had? Uh, well, um, so uh, the unreliable car was BMW. It was the second newer BMW I had in a row. Okay. Um, you know, and, and uh, I, I guess, let me think here. Probably my third car I had was, a, was an old BMW. So in 97, I got a 1987 BMW. It was 10 years old. I had 150,000 miles on it. Got it for like five grand. It was a blast to drive. It was a lot of fun. And I never had any problems with it. It was just, it was a great car. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just, you know, fast forward to me being an adult. I wanted a newer BMW. I thought I had a great experience with that one. So I thought maybe it'd have a good experience with the newer ones. And I had two in a row that were um, not brand new, but within a couple of years old. And um, they did not, they were... They were just, it was, a. I had a lot of problems with both of them back to back. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. over like a four year period. Um, and I just, you know, it, it was never anything serious. I was just having to take it in all the time. You know what I mean? Okay. It's like, if you got to take something in every two or three months and the dealership is an hour away, you yeah. know, and they, and they, and they, they're like, you know, they're happy to give you a rental or whatever, okay. but then you got a, an hour there, hour back, hour there, hour back. So you got four hours and just taking this vehicle in to do something that, you're like, well, I, should, I should have, a, there shouldn't be any issues. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I shouldn't have these simple little issues. Um, you know, with my forerunner, I had it for just shy of four years and I never had to take it in for anything. Not once. It was a, it was a great wow. car. It's a great truck. Um, you know, so my first vehicle actually was a, um, it was an 89 Ford Bronco two. And that one was riddled with problems as well. <laughs> Oh. Um, didn't last very long, but Those were, uh, it was not a four wheel drive. Yeah. I was going to say that was only a two wheel drive vehicle. Wow. It was a two wheel drive. It was my first vehicle. It was standard transmission. It was a, it was, it was a fun first car. Yeah. Um, but, uh, there was, there were some, some really, uh, common problems with those. Um, and one of them, I'm trying to remember what it was. I was not super, still not very mechanically oriented more so than I was, I don't know, 30 years ago, but, but, um, there was something wrong with, I guess, the thermostats. It kept overheating, but it wasn't telling me it was overheating. So there was a combination of problems happening there. And it's, it, I ended up burning up the engine and didn't even know it. You know what I mean? It just yeah. ran, ran hot. So got it. Anyway. So uh, moving into the Forerunner, um, you were saying that you were looking at trucks. So what actually swayed you from going from a truck to the Forerunner like an SUV? Like what, why didn't I get a pickup truck? Yeah. So th that was the question, you know, I knew I wanted a Toyota and I knew I wanted a four wheel drive. And so I knew I was going to get um, either, uh, I didn't want a, I didn't want a Tundra. I just didn't want a big truck. Um, and it was, it was going to be, it was really between Tacoma and Forerunner. Mm -hmm. um, the, the deciding factor between going with the Forerunner over a Tacoma was, Primarily because the whole time I was considering Tacomas, even though there were a lot more options and a lot more, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't understand why Toyota ha had had done this. I think it's improved a little bit, but you could go to a brand new Tacoma and really option it out. I mean, there was a lot of options that you can get with it, uh, including the tech. You know what I mean, like the mm -hmm. dashboard tech and all that. Um, that you just the forerunners were very basic. Um, but, but I kept going with the Tacoma, looking at it going, I'm going to put something over the bed and then I'm going to worry about whether or not whatever I'm putting over the bed is totally weather resistant or weather, weather seal sealing. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to have to worry about camera gear getting wet in the bed. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's what I kept coming back to. And I'm like, geez, if I'm, if I'm not concerned about it, just go with the forerunner and it's totally closed down. I, I realize it's not apples to apples there, but I do have a back part of the vehicle that is completely enclosed and um, sealed in. So that was the ultimate reason why I picked the Forerunner over a truck. Got it. Yeah, um, speaking about camera gear, um, and now you're having me second guess uh, things that I've reading, is you said that, um, I thought I saw somewhere that you said that you've always kind of been doing some photography and video um, film side of things and vlogging was new to you but the camera and video editing was not what uh what other cam photos and video editing have you done you know this is actually an interesting part of part of my backstory in terms of um kind of leading up to this mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of people that are getting into doing any video work or any 
you know, photography work whatsoever. Um, I talked to a lot of people that have never done any of it at all. And, you know, mm -hmm. getting to a point where you're comfortable on camera, you know, it, it doesn't seem hard. And certainly for those of us that do it, it, we're used to it. But when you first start doing it, there's this like weird thing that like when you start looking into that, you know, that, that, yeah. that spherical, you know, lens, you just, yeah. you're like, what was I going to say? You know, you just freeze. Um, and so after a while, you get kind of used to that. I, I was already used to that when I started this sort of swell runner project, if you will. Um, so back in, back in 06, I started a um, really, a, let me think, when was it? It was, yeah, it was, it was about 2006, 2006, it was 06, late 06. I started a blog, an actual, mm -hmm. like, like a, you know, typing writing a blog. Right yeah. out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a, a web, web log. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I had it on Blogger or I think it was Blogspot and then Google bought them and called it Blogger or whatever. And I was writing about the real estate growth and, and uh, tourism and economic development um, sort of in, you know, activities in that Northwest Florida area, specifically Panama City Beach, where, where I was living at the time. I was in real estate. I was heavily involved in real estate. I was uh, heavily involved in the sales and marketing aspect of it from a free construction sales and marketing and construction, you know, perspective. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the market and, th and, and spent a lot of time working with sales agents with a company I was working for. Um, trying to like develop why that area was appealing to other people coming into the market, possibly interested in buying real estate in that market, why they'd want to invest in that area. And so I started writing about the economic development of it. And, and, and that sort of like put me down this path of like learning because I'm like a wood from there, the next, next iteration was I wanted to learn how to make my own website. And this is way mm -hmm. back, you know, this is the, in the early days of like WordPress um, right. self-hosted blogs before it was way before it was considered to be a content management system. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is like web lingo, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, but I, I, it put me down this path of wanting to figure out how a lot of this stuff worked. And so I figured out HTML, I figured out how to use Dreamweaver and Photoshop. And I figured out how to do all these different things and making my own website, to have my own server. I was putting stuff. I remember thinking how liberating it felt to be able to put something on the internet by myself. Like I felt so, it felt cool, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. to just be able to publish information. And I um, started writing a lot. I was publishing quite a bit. Um, started out four or five posts a week. Um, and then sort of that developed into, you know, by the time I got to 2008, I created a business out of it, selling advertising. I was doing it freelance. Um, or I was doing it full time. I brought on two writers, um, you know, and, and we were publishing, you know, 12 to 15 articles a week. Um, and, and we were really involved in the community and I started wow. adding video elements and photography and doing all this stuff. And, um, you know, I found some early videos, you know, and, and, and I'm like, this is Jason Kirchie with PCBDaily.com coming to you from, you know, it's like totally <laughs> news, newsy, you know, was, and I was buying camera gear, you know, and experimenting with things and figuring things out and stuff. And, you know, I used to use, um, gosh, what were those tapes, the mini DV tapes, the little tiny tapes. I think that's what they're yeah. called. I still have, I still have a bunch of them just sitting in some drawer somewhere that I keep telling myself someday I'm going to make it just get it all off onto a computer. But um, so that's, that's, and I did a lot. I mean, I, I, you, that, that channel's still out there. I, I, I think I got access to it at some point and be able to figure out what the blog in was that YouTube it never didn't really have any subscribers. It's just back in the day when you weren't really pushing for that, but that's kind of how I got my start. You know, and I mean, I just right. kind of I played around with that a long time ago and you know, I, I got really burnt out on that stuff and, and eventually just stopped doing it altogether um, and just got into some other things. But, but for a long time, it wasn't, the burnout wasn't playing with the video and the photography and, and it was a little, it was quite a bit the writing. I spent a lot of time writing, but um, I wasn't passionate about that topic anymore. And for a long time, for years, I kept like, like I was always just thinking about like what topic I could finally like be passionate about enough to like create media content, you know, film and, and photography and like, what, what would it be? What content subject matter could I be passionate, passionate enough about to like spend all that time and effort to do, you know what I mean? And um, for years, you know, I just had nothing, I had nothing, you know what I mean? It yeah. was nothing. And, um, and that's when all, all of this happened with the Overland stuff. Like that was, that was the subject matter that was like, you know what, this is, 
everything that I could possibly want. You've got all this fun stuff to play around with and all the gear and the, and the cars. And I've always loved traveling and seeing new places. And then like the whole technical aspect, like I used to do a lot of cave diving, right? So people would ask me, I was, I had a lot of advanced certifications in, in, in underwater cave diving and spent, you know, a lot of time had probably about 150 dives um, you know, probably two, three, 400 hours in, um, you know, under, under, in caves, like underwater wow. with a lot of advanced gear. And people would ask me like, why do you like that over open water? Cause I, I did not like open water diving. It just, it was boring to me. And, you know, people would ask me that. And I, and I would tell them like, you know, there's, there's a difference between like going to the park and like just walking around and then like going to like the park where there's a playground, you get to really play on the equipment and use your whole body and really think. And mm -hmm. that's the, was the difference between open water diving and cave diving. Does that make sense? It's the challenge. And the challenge. And, and but it's mm -hmm. also like messing around with stuff. You know what I mean? Like having a lot yeah. of things happening at one time, you have to like think about, you know, and, and, sure. and I just... I, I think off-roading and overlanding and camping and adventuring, adventure travel, all that stuff, it really, that, it does that for me. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not as much of an overlander as I'm, I like more of a rock crawler. Um, but, you know, even just driving like a hundred, you know, hundred yards down a trail, that's just, you know, rocks the size of Volkswagen bugs. You're just like, okay, yeah. how do I, what do I need to do? And you're thinking of like trying to pay attention to all four tires and how the truck's leaning and you know, how much effort you need to put into it before it stalls. Cause I have a manual, you know, and it's just all, <laughs> all that stuff as you're trying to drive down the trail. And yeah, I fully get it. You know, it's, I, I just was like, I was saying, I was out wheeling um, earlier, you know, or, um, over the weekend, man, and I haven't done it in a while. And I came home and I slept so good just because I was yep. just mentally fatigued and like my, you know, tired. Just, I wasn't necessarily tired, like physically, but I was, right. you know, just amped that I got outside. And yeah, so we had a lot of fun doing that trip. So um, what is some of the things that really drew you into the forerunner? And what is some of the things that actually you um, are upset at or not upset, but kind of miss now with the, the new rig that you have? Um, well, so the primary motivation for going with the Forerunner was because it was a Toyota, and Toyota was um, absolutely um, the reputation for reliability was. It, it, I mean, it completely preceded itself. Yes, is that the right way to put it? Notably, very reliable. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to have. I was not apprehensive about that at all. I knew I would have a, a good experience there, and and I did. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of bells and whistles that the forerunner didn't have that I missed from having in previous vehicles that I of course now have in, in the, in the new vehicle. Um, but, but again, when I had made the decision to go with the forerunner, I, I wasn't, that's not what I was, that wasn't my primary, that wasn't right. what I was looking for. Anyway. Yeah. You, you did state that you weren't even looking at the Tundra cause you didn't want to go full size, you know? So right. that, that wasn't even on, on part of the plan when you're looking at the forerunner. Sure. Right. Um, you know, in terms of, of what I miss from the forerunner that I, you know, I don't miss anything with the forerunner. I mean, the, the only, the, the only, I, okay. So I should put it this way. The only thing that I miss with the forerunner is sort of the assured, the assuredness of reliability. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. While I haven't had any problems with my new, tr new truck, there's this like really common misconception that, that seems to be fairly wild, uh, widely held that I'm going to have reliability issues with this, with this uh, platform. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's been interesting because as I was thinking about moving in that direction and then as I moved in that direction, um, a, a very regular comment was, you're going to have reliability issues with that, whether it was uh, an intelligent, thoughtful <laughs> comment or it was uh, Dodge is suck or yeah. whatever, you know, sure. um, you know, and, and, uh, and but I found oftentimes when I would drill down and talk to people that actually had used these vehicles in the past, most people have not had any issues with them, um, you know, but, but there's that, there's that perception, you know, and so, so in my head, I'm going, I, I'm just naturally apprehensive, right? Like I said, having any problems, but it's like in my head, I'm going, I could, and I'm just, I'm just cautiously optimistic there. So um, I, I went that direction though, because it provided a medium and a platform that I could not find in any other, in any other vehicle, yeah. um, you know? And so um, I, I've, I've really loved it, but excellent. I don't know if you want, want me to. 
we'll talk about it all we'll, a whole lot. I'm sure we'll get to it. But. Yeah, we're, we'll get there. I think uh, I wanted to kind of baby step that direction. Um, we actually got a good question coming in from Ben in regards to motivation that you were discussing a little earlier. Um, what keeps you motivated and has it taken away from your enjoyment of just overlanding? Um, you know, so, so part of, part of the enjoyment that I get from overlanding is capturing the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's an interesting thing, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I like, and I don't like going on trips with people. Um, if it's somebody like, like Kevin, uh, McHouston with Lifestyle Overland, who totally knows what we do as creators when we're out filming and there's a lot of stopping and mm -hmm. there's a lot of like thinking about how I want to do the shot. There's you know, like overlanders that don't capture their experience. And then they go with them with, with somebody like, like me or Kevin, where we stop a lot and we are capturing the experience. It's really frustrating because they're like, dude, we just stopped. Like how many pictures and video clips could you possibly want? Mm -hmm. And you know, what a lot of people don't realize is that we may capture 50 clips and use 25 of those clips. You know what I mean? So, so you're over capturing and you're, you're not using all that. So that's one of the things. The other thing is that, is that there's, there's a balance between doing that and then also sometimes just being there and experiencing what you're, what you're doing. Yes. Um, and, and so, and so that, and that's, I, that's a hard balance for me because oftentimes on my trips, I'm, I'm always thinking about like what I want to capture, but sometimes I have to like dial it back and be like, I don't want to capture this. I just want to experience it. Um, you know, so, so in terms of motivation, it, it really depends. The, the most motivating thing for me to capture content is knowing and going to, or being in remarkable places. And I find that that's sometimes one of the hardest things. Um, going to Ure, Colorado, you're almost, almost assured to be in remarkable setting like a remarkable setting or remarkable areas going out to west desert utah i mean it just kind of depends on where you're at and what you have experienced everything's relative right mm -hmm. but you know for, for me like like just spending a lot of time in deserts especially in utah i feel like a lot of it's a it, it's a lot of the same stuff to me um at least from a content perspective so it's, it's hard to vary the story when you're really trying to capture going to different different areas, um, you know, so, so it just kind of depends, you know, and, and uh, if I'm not going and doing something that I feel like is new and fresh for me, it is hard for me to get motivated. Sometimes I just won't capture very much um, and I'll just keep the story really brief. Mm -hmm. um, so it just kind of depends. I don't know, does that help answer your question? I'm sure. question? Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's good. I think that as a creator, you know, we think about content, content, content all the time. And it's hard, actually somewhat hard and difficult for us to step away from that and put ourselves into the, like, let's just have fun situations. Yeah. Um, I know that like this last weekend that I was talking about, I didn't even take the video cameras. You know, I didn't, I didn't even yeah. want to deal with it. I wanted to hang out with my friends. I wanted to go out on a basic little wheeling trip and just have the fun of wheeling again. And I didn't want to create that content. Mainly, or for a few reasons, mainly because I wanted to hang out with my friends, but I kind of have that video, that same trail on my channel already. So it was kind of nice to be able to just step away and not even deal with it. So I, I understand of, it. Yeah, go ahead. What, I was going to say, one of the things I, I have started doing recently, like in the last six, eight months, is when I go on a trip, um, I used to film capture content, like really like from when I left to like when mm -hmm. I got home. And one of the things that I've stopped doing to try and uh, I don't know, buffering a little bit of a break there and a little bit of a, like, I'm just going to experience this part of it and not focus on capturing um, is I don't film when I'm going to location, uh, wherever I'm, you know, yeah. uh, having the trip. And then I don't film usually like the last day. So a lot of times I'll get up and then we'll mess around for a little while. And then we'll about halfway through the day, we'll, we'll, we'll go home. Um, and like, I won't film, I won't film that. And I'll just kind of be right. present. So it's, it's cut down on the amount of uh, content that I could have from one particular trip, but also it's, it's the less fun aspect of the story. And it allows me to have sort of like a break buffer to kind of like work in and work out of, uh, you know, capturing content on, on a trip. Definitely. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I do a lot of mine as well. Similar. I only really start 
from like trailheads and at the trail end. And then, you know, anything yeah. that happens after that, you know, it's, it's off air. So yeah, understood. Yeah. Um, as somebody that is an avid overlander like yourself um, and has experienced camping in many different platforms, what is your thoughts and suggestions on um, rooftop tents on a rig, rooftop tents on the trailer or a ground tent? You know, so sometimes I was just thinking about this recently, how, um, you know, I was think I was, I wasn't considering it, but I was, I was thinking about the idea of going back to a ground tent. I'll tell you one of the things that I, that I absolutely hate about ground tent camping. I can't sleep on the ground, you know, with my back and neck, I just, I'm a side sleeper. It just, mm -hmm. it doesn't work for me. I'm super uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I can sleep on a cot. I can definitely sleep in a hammock if I need to. Um, that works, but you know, ground tent camping, if I have a cot, if I bring something along, even if it's a simple, lightweight, really expensive option, it's still one more thing to take with you, one more thing to set up, um, you know, and then that times two or three, if I've got kids with me, um, you know, because if I'm bringing a cot for myself, they're like, where's my cot, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah. sleep on the ground, kid, you know, but it's <laughs> yeah. like, you know, the, the point is the rooftop tent really solves all that in, in one package, right? It's great. Mm -hmm. Plus in most, in most rooftop tent applications, you can store a lot of your sleeping and bedding uh, stuff, you know, pillows and sleeping bags in the tent, right. um, which, which solves that, that, that problem of storage as well. Um, you know, so, so in terms of, uh, you know, rooftop tent to ground tent, um, I mean, rooftop tent is a no brainer. You know, there's a reason why they're more expensive because they do provide more value. Um, I think in terms of um, convenience, comfort, capability, et cetera. Uh, there's a ton of rooftop tent options, you know, and, and I just recently moved to an eye camper, which is a hard shell. The primary reason why I, I went that direction was because they, there's a couple of other options out there, but they're really the, the most well-known hard shell option that opens up to a platform that's big enough for me and two of my kids. You really can mm -hmm. put four people in there. I would say four adults would be pretty snug. Uh, I wouldn't want to do that, but you could. Um, but me and two of my kids, is, it works just fine. Um, and, um, the other thing that's nice about it is a very slim profile, um, you know, that versus the architecture of like, say a 23 zero or, or a CVT, the traditional style, those are great tents and the arch uh, architecture is, is wonderful. You have way more storage capacity in those types of tents in terms of fitting sleeping bags and pillows up there, but it's a heavy, it's, it's a, it's a heavy piece of hardware to maneuver and, and mess with firstly. Secondly, there's, there's the bag that, that goes over the top. It's, it's pretty cumbersome to work with. It's, it's not the end of the world. I did it for years, but, mm -hmm. but compared to like the style that the eye camper is, for instance, it's, um, it's much more difficult to, 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 to manhandle, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, what was the other question? What, in, um, in regards to trailers. So, you know, trailers opened up a whole nother discussion, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I trailered, um for i guess two and a half years maybe almost was it almost three years it was a, i mean i loved it it was a great solution um but but i, I ultimately i i never really felt tired of it i did I, I never felt like it was a burden to me when i was trailering in the southeast when i lived in florida but it was like after i moved out here like like by the second or third trip i was i was just done trailering does that make hmm. sense? So, and I think the primary reason, I, I, I guess maybe the terrain out here was just more, more technical. I, I don't know. It okay. just, it just started feeling like, like, like I was like, like, oh, Jason's coming with his trailer. Like we're going to walk him through everything. You know what I mean? It's like, okay. I just felt like I was a burden all the time. And I felt like I was always me that was complicating everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was feeling that way, interestingly enough, before I did the flop. Okay. Um, you know, and, and then of course that was sort of the culmination after that. It's like, here comes Mr. Swell runner with this trailer and he rolls it down because he's trying to trailer in the snow. It's like, you know, I'm like, do I really, and this, that's when I really started looking at this going, do I really need this? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The yeah. prime advantage for me for having a trailer was if I was, if I was like, like a cooking person, like I liked to cook. The trailer would be like invaluable. It was a huge kitchen. It was a lot of storage, you know, a lot of really great, like, like if I was Marco, you know, with trail recon and Brad, you know, if mm -hmm. I was like going on those trips, and I was cooking all the time, like the trailer would come really in handy. Right. Definitely. 
man, I'm making oatmeal and boiling water. You know what I mean? Like I'm not cooking. I hate <laughs> cooking. Oils. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's ultimately what it came down to. Trailer was got awesome. It. Turtleback's awesome. Um, I just, I got tired of pulling the trailer. Yeah. I actually uh, would like to show the video of the flop that uh, happened um, out on the trail. Where, uh, were you in Colorado when that happened? No, it was in Utah. It was, was down it in, in Utah? San Rafael Swell. Yeah. Okay, definitely. All right. Well, let me uh, let me pull this up real quick, and I'll sh give a quick little share of this video of you crawling down the trail right here. Let's see. Here we go. Backing up is also the tricky part. So we got a trailer here. We had a Tacoma that was barely able to make it up, so That's hopefully the trail's broken in. We're gonna see. We'll see. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, I'm gonna need it. AJ, move! It's good. No problem. That was good. Non that one was good. I broke the trail. It's easy for everyone now. <laughs> was there just a weird off camber here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing about trailering in the snow, actually, it's not just snow, it's any slippery conditions whatsoever is. Yeah um your your trailer is going to take the path of least resistance and it's going to it's going to follow gravity right sure um so so anytime uh you're in mud or you're in snow or any sort of slippery condition the trailer is no drive line right so it's just being pulled and it's literally just going to slide wherever gravity is and so you can see i mean the hill is it's it's a little bit sloped down a little mm -hmm. bit and then there was there was it, it was a little bit off camber but there was a little bit of a rock so the trailer slid it hit a rock and it just it just it flipped over on its side i mean it just it did the only thing that it could do and you know i'm really fortunate that we were and i shouldn't where have. we were because it could have i mean if we were in like in like another area where it's like one of those like ledge roads or whatever like that would have yeah. been really scary and really dangerous this definitely road was yeah with no snow I mean, extremely tame road. Um, the problem with this particular uh, area and time, it was it was beginning of March. Uh, there was snow on the ground, but it was like 60 degrees out. And so, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with, with, with driving in the snow. I'm certainly not very familiar with it at all. But, you know, when you, when you got snow that is sitting in the sun for only a few hours out of the day and you happen to be in the snow during the sun of that period, it's just melting and it's very slippery. Yeah, that was, yeah, I understand that was not that. fun. <laughs> oh, it didn't didn't look exciting at all. I'm I'm happy that you know it didn't roll more and like actually no. bring your rig with you. You know that that no. all sign kind of seems like a scary situation. I've been considering a trailer for a while just because you can carry more gear and kind of take more with you, and it's a little easier for your rig to pull a trailer than to add all that weight onto the actual vehicle itself. Yeah. But um, it's I, all about I, finding the balance, right? Yeah. That trailer had a pretty high center of gravity. Um, it, it was, uh, I think, exacerbated by the fact that it had um, an icon suspension system on it, which really increased the road manners significantly and, and increased the trail manners too. But you know, that, and that tent was, was one of the biggest CVT tents, 300 pound tent. I mean, there was, a lot of little factors there. If it would have been uh, one of Turtleback's um, adventure chaser trailers, whatever they're called, the the smaller, mm -hmm. much lower, uh, you know, center of gravity trailers, it would have just slid. It would have been a non-issue. Um, right. it, it was it was a combination of things that that really led to that particular scenario. Sure, absolutely. And I think a, to me, the trailer is the answer for like if you're camping in multiple or one spot for multiple nights. Oh, absolutely. Right. If you're doing that, then you can drop trailer and you can go and wheel on your rig and you can go and have yep. fun. But if you're changing locations all the time, then I, to me, I'm probably just going to keep a rooftop tent on my truck. Well, and that was one of the, um, that was one of, one of the really strong deciding factors in terms of trying to decide whether or not to go with the trailer in the first place 
uh, it, it was because it did seem uh, w when I bought the trailer, I didn't have a whole lot of trips under my belt mm -hmm. um, or a lot of experience, you know, overlanding, if you will. Um, and but one of the things that I realized is that is that three or four years into it, I, I realized that I I preferred to move every day. Okay. I never dropped trailer and stayed in one location and explored. I never did that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when I when I realized also. Um, you know, in addition to the fact that I didn't need all of the storage and water and food and cooking and all that stuff capability, um, in addition to that, and knowing that I, I never explored, realizing I never really explored any areas, I always moved every day. I mean, I looked at them like, this is, I'm taking something with me that that is unnecessary. I don't need it. Right. Understood. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, I need to find that balance for myself as well. Cause especially in rock crawling, you know, yeah. where to tow a trailer, or like through the Rubicon, you know, is you, where you pretty much you could, you could do it. Yeah, I mean, if you had the right and you had yeah. the, if you had the right trailer and the, and the skill set and capability, I mean, it, it could probably be done. I, I can't say mm -hmm. that it could be done, but no, but, um, it you, would as, be challenging for yeah, sure though. As long as you're going forward, right. <laughs> as soon as you had to reverse that thing. Right. On a rocky right. trail, I, I can't imagine, but um, yeah, I don't know. Fun. Maybe I'll try it one day. We'll see. Uh, so let's move forward. This, what do you have now? Let's talk about the Ram and the, it's a, a prospector. Is that correct? So it's a it's a Ram 2500, 2017 Ram 2500 Cummins with the Cummins um, four wheel drive. It's a prospector XL build. And so what that means is that, uh, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's a delineating difference here. American Expedition Vehicles, also known as AEV, builds serial numbered prospector XLs. And so what that means is that if you are a consumer and you walk into or a purchaser and you walk into a Ram dealer and you want to buy one of these and they're a certified AEV dealer, you can option out your Ram pickup exactly the way you want for all the, with all the factory options that you get from if you were to be buying a new truck. And then basically what they do is they take that truck and it and it's delivered to American Expedition Vehicles who then basically upfits it and converts it into a Prospector XL. So uh, Prox Prospector XL, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of little things, but basically in summary, the, the few things that, that, that give it the, the look that's certainly identifying um, is basically a two and a half inch lift, the high mark fender flares, which they cut the fenders and in, which really increases your capacity to have a larger tire. Okay. Uh, they put the AEV wheels on there and the 40 inch Toyo tires um and that and and then snorkel is is one of the things that, that some of them do get it some of them don't and then it's the front bumper and now the rear bumper and those things are like the primary things there's 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 several like probably 20 or 30 other little things um you know like badging and and you know plating and stuff like that but those are the things that really identify it as a prospector xl and then what AV does is is not only is it obviously a ram still a ram pickup truck but it's a serial numbered uh, AEV Prospector XL. Um, that that um, that I mean, it's it's that's what it is. It's a it's an actual Prospector XL. Mine's just a Ram 2500 that they took all the same stuff that they put on a Prospector XL. They put it on my truck, um, but it's not. It wasn't built by AEV, it, and it's mm. not a serial number Prospector XL. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, Brian in the chat asks if it has any lockers. It does not have lockers um, now for a long time, you could not get an actual AEV Prospector XL um, as a power wagon. They were only diesel. Okay. Um, and so, so the Ram power wagon does not come in, in a diesel. It's only the V8 Hemi. Um, but, but in the last couple of years, um, they did start, AEV did start offering to do the Prospector XL uh, upfitting to Ram power wagons so you could okay. have the front and rear lockers the disconnecting sway bars all that stuff mm -hmm. um and um you know i, I ultimately I, I i wanted the diesel um the the power wagon was very appealing to me because you have the primarily because you've got the built-in front and rear lockers and the disconnecting sway bars i mean who wouldn't be attracted to that um but but um you know when i met with aev at sema um 2019 and I talked to several of their, uh, you know, representatives. All of them were like, you know, personally, if I was going to run 40s, I'd want the diesel. Um, just it's got more power, so it pushes all that rubber a little bit better. 
Um, I, I'm sorry, there's also a re-gear involved in, in okay. converting to a prospect or Excel. That's an important component, by the way. Um, and um, th that's ultimately why I went the diesel route. The, the main, I, I felt like I got really lucky in what I bought um, because, you know, to buy an actual prospect or Excel new from the factory, they're like $90,000. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and if you take an optioned out Ram truck and you want to go put all of the prospect or Excel components on there, you're still going to get pretty close to that $90,000 price mark. You can save some pennies for sure, because on that uh, like part list, mm -hmm. when you're ordering the prospect or Excel, there's probably two or three grand or maybe more um, in badging that doesn't do anything other than tell people what it is. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Not, they're not performance modifications. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, you know, people are like, oh, 90, it's like, you know, if you option out a Ram Cummins, I mean, it, it, the difference between an optioned out Ram and an optioned out Ram with the Cummins diesel, it's like almost a $10,000 difference. Like there's a lot, like that motor is a, is a premium, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, so it, it just depends on what you want. But this one, this truck, it had the Cummins, it had the AEV conversion. I mean, it had all the stuff that a Prospect, Prospect or XL had. Uh, had all of the the bells and whistles, the features needed, seats, you know, things that you'd want in Utah, um, and um, you know, cruise control, obviously, you know, power window, sunroof, creature comforts. Sure. Um, and I got it for far less than a brand new Prospect XL. Now it's a two year old vehicle, and it already had seventy five hundred miles on it. But I mean, like I said, I mean, if you want to make a good financial decision when buying a vehicle, buy a used vehicle. <laughs> Smart. You know. Wise words have never been spoken. I think on this show. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I remember. So at SEMA on 2000, in 2019, um, yeah, I met you there. Exactly. And then we were standing right in front of a prospector. Yeah, it was AJ's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, fo photo runner. Um, yes. If you follow me on Instagram, you probably, you probably seen him around. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so I was wondering if that was one of the deciding factors is, you know, meeting me in front of that prospector there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the, the, the it, it, I, I, for a while there was, was absolutely saying it was a hundred percent AJ's fault. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I remember, uh, gosh, when was it? It was, it was November of 18. We're on, we're on a, our, our first trip that we'd ever gone on together. We're, we're in death Valley, the same trip we did November mm -hmm. of 19. Um, and, uh, you know, we're talking. And, and, and he's just like, you know, cause we're, I mean, at that point, I'm already thinking of like trying to decide what's next, but you know, the, it, it took me so long. I mean, I, I have a history of changing cars every, every one to two years. I mean, as I, oh. as I, I've always done that, you know, okay. I mean? I've just always been ready for the next thing. Um, but, but I put so much into the forerunner and I never had any problems with it. And I, I was, it just, I was, I was constantly indecisive of what I wanted to do next. And that's one of the reasons why. I was, I just stayed in that platform for as long as I did, because it, I mean, that speaks volumes to that platform. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't forcing me out. <laughs> it, was, it was just fine keeping me there. And I was just fine being there. Um, but AJ, you know, we were talking about that and AJ was like, you know, prospect or Excel, man, that's next. I'm like, dude, you're crazy. That's like a $90,000 truck. Like, are you serious? He was like, you think about it everything that you've put into the forerunner and all of the, you know, the parts and the, all this stuff. And he's like, it's like, you don't have to do anything. The prospect director said it's got a, it's got a winch. It's got a lift. I mean, it's, it's turnkey. It's ready to go. You know what I mean? And sure. It's at the high end of, of that, of that number. You know what I mean? No, even with a forerunner, you buy a new forerunner, you put all that stuff, you're not going to get to 90 grand, but you get 70 grand real fast. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, um, and, and does everybody do that? Do it like, no, uh, you know, it's just, there's, there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of variables out there. And, and, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how it started. Sure. So has the full width um, or a full size rig hindered you on trails? Have you not it's, been in it long enough kind of to tell or? Um... It, it's hard to say. I, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you, um, I am not out every weekend. Um, I, in fact, I'm lucky to be able to go out on a one or two night camping trip every month. I mean, it usually doesn't even happen that frequently. I, this is definitely a pavement princess. I'm driving it to and from work. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a grocery getter for the mm -hmm. most part. Um, but, but, um, but, but, but I do enjoy really driving it. Of course, uh, the few trips that I've been on so far, that has not been a problem, even a little bit. 
Um, there, there are uh, certainly trails in Ure mm -hmm. that I would not do in it. Uh, Black Bear is one of them. And to be fair, I would not do Black Bear again in my forerunner. So <laughs> it's just, okay. uh, call, say what you will. I, I'm, I'm too much of a scaredy cat to do a trail like that again. It was, I was, I just, I don't know, man, life's too short. I don't really, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of other things to do out there. Um, it, it, uh, there, there are definitely some areas that I can think of in URA that, that, that maybe I wouldn't want to, uh, do, but, but not many. I mean, I, I would, I would be comfortable. I believe in, in I'm on, uh, do an imaging pass. Um, I think I've done engineer. Uh, I can't think of any other corkscrew and, and a lot of the Alpine loop. Um, you know, I, I don't believe I would have any issue with, with it. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, when Colin powers four, four by four or four wheel drive or whatever, um, he had passed through and, and we just kind of spent a little bit of time and I did some measurements and my truck, I can't remember. I wrote it down. It was, it was only like a half an inch or an inch wider than his and maybe an inch or two longer than his from wheel to wheel, you know, and I had a lot more ground clearance. So, um, you know, it, it, it looks big. And it is big, don't get me wrong, but it's not as big as it may feel like it looks. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. No, I I, I understand. And it's because um, I have a 1991 Toyota pickup, right? Which is the a mini truck style. Yeah. And the bed dimensions of my 2016 Tacoma and my um, 91 Toyota pickup are the same size. There's just more yeah. fender there, but the right. internal yeah. dimensions are all about the same. So it's you know, it looks like the truck's so much larger, but it's not really all that much bigger than the mini trucks. Right. It's longer, right. but it's not that much yeah. wider. So, I, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. So going along, um, well, I did want to say that I watched your one of your most recent videos and you were going through this kind of like little woodsy area and you did bring the mirrors in with, you know, yep. to go through this area. And I was like, man, he's just showing off now. <laughs> you know, it's nice to be able to do that. I mean, in the forerunner, I had to reach out and pull them in um, mm -hmm. or just let whatever is going to hit them, hit them. And yeah. And uh, so it, 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 it's wider. Um, if, and if you're on a, on a trail that, that, that is notably tight, um, I mean, it is what it is. And people are like, oh, you're going to scratch up the fenders. And it's like, I mean, I, the forerunner is getting scratched. You get scratches. I mean, it happens. You know what I mean? And it's like, I don't know. I just, yeah. it is what it is. It doesn't bother me even a little bit. So. So after all this traveling around the nation and going to all these beautiful places, where are some of the top locations that you have been? Super cliche, you're is uh, an easy, easy top. Okay. Um, and what happened? Did it come? Did I? Okay, there I am. I'm, you're still um, with me. Cool. You're is great. Um, I mean, I, I've never experienced an area that's just so remarkable. Um, you know, the time, limited time I spent uh, in Anza Borrego was, was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Death Valley is, is incredible and it's incredibly varied as well. I just absolutely love Death Valley. Uh, and I've, I've, I haven't even seen a fraction of what there is to see in Death Valley. Um, interestingly enough, um, th there's a lot of fun stuff in U Utah, obviously. Moab is, is, is a good classic. Um, and, and if you're into to more technical terrain, there's, there's plenty of opportunity there. But there's also a lot of really interesting opportunity for overlanding that a lot of people don't think about. Um, and there's a lot of great kind of backcountry BLM routes as well. Um, interestingly enough, being out here, I find myself every day missing the Southeast, North Georgia and South Carolina and Tennessee mountains, like every day, I miss it more and more. Oh, wow. um, you know, and, and, and when I say mountains, they're not really mountains compared to out here, but the interesting thing about the terrain out there is, is that you can really enjoy those forests year round. You know what I mean? I mean, there really isn't a time of year where those trails are, it gets cold in the winter, but it's not cold like here. You know what I mean? Right. And um, it gets wet. Yeah. But it's right. not like downpours all crazy all the time. Yeah. Right. Well, there's yeah. not snow like there is out here. Sure. Um, you know, it, it'll snow there, but it won't, it won't linger at all really. Um, so I, I find myself missing that a lot. Um, and in uh, those North Georgia mountains, I mean, they're, you know, like the Georgia Traverse and some of the original things that I was doing. Um, it's a really remarkable area to see as well, the Blue Ridge Mountains and stuff. So, um, you know, I, I haven't been to the Pacific Northwest and I was really hoping that while I was out and living in this part of the country, I'd be able to get up there and I haven't been able to do that yet. Um, there is some terrain and really countryside in Northern California and you know, and, and also up into Oregon and Washington that I've seen pictures of that just looks 
mind-blowingly amazing and mm -hmm. um and i would i would like to i would like to see some of that so that's awesome yeah no so definitely i think i should just say at first is if you come to northern california you better let me know because i'll be more than happy to take you out on a few trails out this way um, where are you about i'm outside of sacramento okay. i'm on like between sacramento and lake tahoe okay so, cool. yeah um and i was going to ask how you determine how uh, places to go do you do research of like beautiful photos that you find on like instagram or somewhere else and then choose to or then find out where they are to go visit them or is it something just hearsay and you know what what's the kind of the final factor in your choices there that has been the biggest challenge for me um because i don't have a lot of experience doing this the experience that i have has been very limited and, and sort of isolated within a short amount of time period of time in my life in the last mm -hmm. you know, four years of my life or so um and and i've learned a lot about different areas but you know finding finding overland routes is like that's the eternal that's the eternal problem to solve you know what i mean yeah. um and uh so 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 yeah so um you know one of the easiest things is is to go with somebody that's been in some areas that can kind of show you around and then has uh has had some experience in those areas um, other things that I've done in the past is I've watched YouTube videos of of others that I follow and, and been like, wow, that looks like a really fun trail or a cool area or whatever. Yeah. And I'll reach out to them and and um, and get locations, um, you know, and, and same thing with Instagram as well, you know, but it, it's it's gotten weird the last couple of years because there's been there's been this pressure of, you know, sort of in the community of like not sharing your location. And, um, you know, and, and, and I don't I don't wholly disagree with it. But but I, I also, you know, I mean, I guess first let me say, if that's if that's you and that's how you are and that's you know who you are and how you want to do it, like like I don't I'm not judging you. Like like you have every right to to, to protect that if you if you feel like that's important to you. But I, I think mm -hmm. I think concurrent with that, it's important for us to be as as people that are sharing content. It's important for us to be trying to underscore the importance of taking care of places you know what i mean and yes. being responsible and and it's and it's hard it's hard it's hard because you know when you share locations of places and people find that and then it's abused you know it's, it's just there's a whole lot of things that you can't do anything about it's, mm -hmm. it's the world we live in absolutely i guess what i'm trying to say is 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 sometimes it's hard to get information as soon as you don't want to ask because that you don't want people to be like shame on you i'm not telling you anything these are private you got to figure it out on your own and i guess but then on the other hand it's like you know i'm a dad i've got seven kids i've got five at home i've got a business i've got a wife like i don't have any free time to just go wander around and explore and be like okay that's cool i'm going to check that out next time i'm out because like these little bits of time that i get to go explore like i really for me personally, I have to try and maximize that to its fullest potential. Um, I don't have a lot of just ex explore, exploratory time. I really want to see the best in the amount of time that I have. Um, right. So I, I don't have a good, I don't have a great answer for you on that, but those are some of the things that I've dealt with and struggled with and, and kind of how I sort of approach that. So, Got it. No, that makes sense. And I, I kind of feel the same way. You know, um, I did see in one of your videos that you were trying to, um, not in gross, but kind of teach your kids to, you know, clean up the campsite better than you guys showed up at, you know, with it as, and you're telling them that they, everybody needs to pick up 10 pieces of trash. Um, you know, that's not ours, you know, pick up all of our trash and then pick up 10 more pieces of trash um, before yeah. we leave this campsite. And I think that's, you know, that's wise words. And if we can get the people to respect the land more, you know, then we will be able to, uh, you know, they won't be doing as many closures and they won't have, you know, be threatening us with, you know, shutting down trails as much, you know, so. The thing I think a lot of people that, that are really protective of that information, I th think I think a lot of them don't realize though is, and I may be totally wrong in saying this, but, but mm -hmm. I, in my experience in all of the people that I've met in this overland community, if you will, um, those aren't the people that are causing the damage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's the it's the people that that they're always going out in the back country. That you know, it's it's these it's it's this stereotypical, and I, I'm going to say something with the risk of offending somebody, <laughs> but it's that it's that stereotypical like sort of redneck party kind of mentality where. 
they don't care about anything else. They're just yeah. going out there to have a campfire and shoot guns into the fire and drink. And, and they're just not thinking about their actions. They're just leaving it however they leave it. It's the same person that's throwing trash out their window. Doesn't happen very often. You don't see it very often, but it happens. And that, that, I think those are the people that are doing that. And a lot of times those people, they're not watching our content. They're not mm -hmm. overlanding. They're just, right. they're just going out to the country, you know? So it's, it's hard, but I think, I think, I think it is important to set the, try and set a good example and to try and share that good example so that others can see that there is importance in trying to keep this stuff clean. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. I got two more questions for you. Uh, one of them's coming in from Ben Kim on uh, the chat here. He said, speaking of ba um, Black Bear Pass, have you ever gotten yourself um, over your head while you're out solo? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, um, this is, here's the thing that I was talking to somebody about something the other day and they're like, oh man, if we go up that trail, um, it was the trip we were on two weeks ago or, or the week, last week, um, you know, we were talking about maybe going up this little mountain trail and, uh, and I was like, you know, worst case scenario, we just back down. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, it's like, that's the worst case scenario. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've gone down a path with my trailer. And been like, ooh, and you know, you can't turn around very easily yeah. in a trailer, um, and so you kind of. I got really good with backing up a trailer. I mean, I could back a trailer up really good, <laughs> um, and uh, I can't tell you how many times down a, a set, not a real technical, but down a, a trail where it, you wouldn't really want to back a trailer up, where I'd had to back a trailer up, um, you know, and, and had to had to navigate that. Um, there was one of my um, very first, actually, my very first trip that I that I filmed. Um, we did a section, we did the Georgia Traverse in Georgia, and there was a section on Trey Mountain. Um, and those of, of, of your of your listeners that have been on the Georgia Traverse are familiar with that stretch. It's fairly technical. I mean, it's uh, in hindsight, it's not it's not very technical um, mm -hmm. compared to some of the things that have done since. But having never done that before, I got to that and there were some, some you know, rock drops, you know, that were 12, 14 inches, you know, little ledge drops or something. And I was wholly uncomfortable. You know what I mean? I was like, I'm not doing this. I have no idea what my vehicle is going to do. I had no experience, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, the worst case scenario, I mean, and this is something you have to think about when you're going down a trail. Um, you have to be thinking about, okay, can I back up through this next section if I get to a worse section? Um, you know, you have to be thinking about that. Um, but I, I should also throw the disclaimer out though. If you have any apprehension about what's coming, stop your vehicle, get out and walk it. Just, just walk it and think about it. I mean, I can't tell you mm -hmm. how many times I've walked like an eighth or a quarter of a mile down the trail, come back, you know, I take my radio with me in case one of the kids need to radio me or somebody else in the group, um, you know, cause I may be gone for 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, that's the thing. If you have any apprehension if, or, or if you're, you're not really all that comfortable, just stop the vehicle, get out and walk it. I mean, that's yeah. the worst that can happen. You'd be like, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm going to either turn around or I'm going to back up or I'm going to you know, go back the other way. I mean, that's the worst that can happen. So nah, that's great advice. That's, uh, that's awesome. So uh, my last question for you here is um, what is next for the channel? Where, where are things going from here? Is it continue to overland? Are we going to be going crazy and going international? Uh, any, any fun plans that you can spill for us? No, I mean, I, I wish I wish I had some some great plans. You know, I mean, I mean, to be honest, the last um, you know year year and a half has been really tough for me to continue to manage doing um, you know some of the video and 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 trips and content and stuff that I've been doing um, because mm -hmm. because it's I'm passionate about it. I really enjoy it. It's a fun, great creative outlet that actually I, I personally need. Um, but but work has gotten super complicated in the last um, you know two years since I moved to. Park City and tried to open up, or, or actually I, I bought a small company and did open an office. Um, life's gotten really complicated for me and, and, um, and, I, and I don't like that. Um, and, and there is actually going to be some big changes in my personal life. Um, I can tell, I'll tell you offline, um, but, uh, but we're, we've got COVID-19 world has changed a lot. We've got massive losses in our Florida business. Actually, as of right now, um, you know, we are, our, our business we have been banned from operating vacation rentals cannot accept or accommodate travelers right now it's been criminalized it's it's wow. actually it's 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 
it's disgusting to be honest. Um, there's there's a, a, a quickly growing movement in the state of Florida. Um, owners and small businesses like ours are are we're we're being irreparably damaged. We're having we're mounting losses. It's <sighs> another story. But um, yes, because of all that, there's there's some really big life changes for us coming up. Um, we're frankly really excited about it. But um, we're going to be simplifying a lot of things and. It's going to enable me, I think, to be able to do some more things and kind of have a little more fun in some areas. Um, but but uh, but I don't have any like great grandiose plans or trips or whatever. In terms Got of the it. Channel. But, Got it. But changes are coming. It sounds. And change, changes are definitely coming. We're going to okay. see some some fun things here in the future. <laughs> Excellent. Well, now as uh, we come to the end of this series, I want to give you an opportunity to plug yourself, talk about uh, where people can find you if they if you want to share how people can contact you, you know, feel free. Uh, well, I mean, you can find me on Instagram. Um, you know, the, this, this, if you just, if you just search for swell runner, uh, and that's spelled S W E L L runner, R U N N E R. I'm sure you can see that in show notes. If you Google that it, wherever you can find me, it pops up. I'm on YouTube and I'm on Instagram. I've got a website that I don't do anything with, <laughs> but there's contact. You can DM me best easiest way. If you want to reach out to me directly is DMing me on Instagram. Um, because I, I, I watch that pretty regularly. Um, I'm in there most every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, that's probably the most way to, the, the easiest way to interact, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at. Excellent. Uh, I guess one little last question, are you going to change the name of your channel to swell Ram? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm just gonna leave it. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, a name's a name, you know what I mean? And it can mean whatever you want it to mean. And, and uh, a lot of people have said that, but no, I'm, I'm just going to leave it. All right. Good. Awesome. Thank you, Jason, for your time. Appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Uh, you need to let me know whenever you make it out to California. Yeah, for sure. I really appreciate the time and I really appreciate the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. I've uh, been on a couple of podcasts before, but not very many. I've never been on a live stream like this before. So I'm super curious to see how it turned out. And uh, yeah. I think you're doing a great job as well. So I appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.